Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> and what I just said was super profound too, and yeah. missed it on the recording. Yeah. Go ahead and say it again. Just kidding. Don, so that just it, kidding. It, but it was actually, <laughs> it was, it was actually, it, it was super profound, and you should repeat it. <laughs> what Don said is is that instead of saying reference implementation example implementation, there's three different implementation headings that we should just have. I think one heading that says implementations and what that is can vary by the specific metric. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever the most clear explanation of the metric is, whether it's a notebook or a Grimoire Lab implementation or both or an Augur implementation or all three, whatever, whatever helps make what the metric is more clear in a concrete way should be under implementation, I think is what maybe you're saying. So here's kind of the two, four, six. But I, I just went and pulled them out of one of the evolution metrics. So that's in the chat. Yes. I, oh, yeah. I'll put it in the regular. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, So I just put it in the Google Doc. That's the current structure. Let's say evolution was using. So this is for the type B, I suppose, um, template. Mm -hmm. And it's this, it's these, these two, these reference implementation and known implementations that are sometimes Using, I think. But did you yeah, also say that, I agree. Like I thought that could be reduced to one for sure. Well, and and even sometimes like we have visualizations, which yeah, they're just should basically be. they just they could show up again as sample implementations. I, and I, I think um, filters are filters are important because okay. that specific so, and visualizations I think could be under implementation. Like if we had one implementation heading, there could be a subheading in there for visualizations. And I think that would be more clear because filters are actually something, and you guys, somebody tell me if I'm wrong, I wish I wish Jesus was here, but what we, we had this discussion about whether a filter, whether they call it a filter or a uh, parameter um, way back when. And filters are essentially the expected um, method inputs effect essentially that you would be able to provide a tool uh, to get a subset of data showing that metric, right? So common filters are repository, um, date range, things mm -hmm. like that. And I think it's that's it's very sub it's very different than filters. And so, I mean, then visualization. So I'm I wasn't there for the discussion of merging those headings. Oh, I <laughs> but. I don't know that anybody was, I, okay. <laughs> or we all were all. It's one of those things that I just yeah. kind of organically came about. So, I mean, I, if I, I feel like I'm talking a lot on this call, which is weird, but I, I think filters should stand on its own. If I was to make a change, I would say filters can stand on its own because it is a very specific thing with a very specific purpose. And visualizations and implementations could be a heading or even just implementations, and then it could have subheadings that were things like product implementations or, or uh, not product, but uh, known like basically Grimoire Lab, Fogger, uh, example visualization could be subheadings under implementations that serve to clarify in a concrete way what the metric looks like when it's done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think filters. It ends up being a subheading under filters and visualizations anyway. I mean, these are these are ways that we want to any implementation of the metric to be able to 
winnow it down. And it's typically at least by repository and date range. What are other what are some other thoughts on this too? I'm curious. I mean, even I mean, can filters and visualizations just go under like as a sub bullet under implementations? That's what it sounds like. A filter ultimately the filter becomes an implementation. The in the cases where we don't have an implementation yet. The filter is effectively a specification for the, the ways that you should be able to narrow the data set. Um, so sometimes it's not implemented, but implementation, did you suggest implementation and filter drain? No, I was, I was just saying like under, under implementations, like we have the sub, subsections for visualizations and another subsection for filters. We could. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I think, I think I want it to remain clear that, that like a fil the filter list is intended as like if you're going to claim that you're implementing the auger metric that you're going to implement the filters that are enumerated in the definition. Um, that's the only reason maybe I'm reluctant to take filter and put it under implementation, but that's totally pedantic and. I think it's probably just fine to do that. Okay. On my part. I think uh, to a degree that kind of comes back, oh, that kind of comes back to what Matt, Matt was asking early on. So like how, how much information do we really need to put in these documents? So filters, filters are important uh, for the auger implementation, but is it important for the, the metrics definition? So can we create another document? So actually filters I don't think are important. Filters are important for, I send, I think essentially instructing anyone who implements the metric on what the filter should be. So Augur, Grimoire Lab, um, Joe's Python, Open Source Lab, any, anyone, it's like we want, like we don't, when we agree on a filter, the discussions I've been in have generally focused on the idea that the metric isn't helpful unless you can filter the data these ways. So it's, you it's, kind of, it's more of a software requirement than an implementation. Right. Jumping back into pandemic mode, sorry. Um, other people's thoughts on this? I don't necessarily think Kevin's wrong. I'm just saying my thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I, I had just put this out here, right? I'm just yeah. trying to think through this. And, and like I said, maybe the structure stays the same, but I... I mean, I kind I, of agree with, with Kevin. I'm not sure, I mean, if we, if we think about the chaos objective being to define the metrics and give good definitions for how we, how we calculate a certain thing or how you would gather a particular metric, I'm not sure that, I mean, there are always going to be loads of ways that you can filter it and they're super important to how people use them, but I'm not sure that it's really part of the definition. I don't know. I could probably be talked I, into it either way. That's well, where, I think that's where I am too. And I'm Kevin and Kevin and Don are persuading me to just think about it that I think we should do that. I mean, those are, and we don't and I, I think about it way too on the technical concrete level sometimes. And so I think what I'm hearing from Kevin and Don is, is they want to understand the metric that's not as important. So I can tell you just like, this is purely anecdotal. There's no research behind this. But when I talk to people who take a look at the chaos metrics, you know, who are kind of looking at the metrics, oftentimes it's just um, I was taking a look, like this is the anecdotal part. I was taking a look at the metrics just to kind of see what, what's available to take a look at. Uh, it's not about how I would implement it. It's not about where I would source the data, but it's just to help me as a person kind of get my head around what are the things that are available to me and how might I think about those? So I think the work in the working groups, like you know that whole, whole question metric with the focus areas, that's been extremely helpful. I hear a lot of the conversation about that, but I 
it usually stops about there when we talk about metrics. And then the whole deployment implementation part is kind of a next question. So in that case, it's really just about expressing a definition. <laughs> here, here are the things yeah. that are available. That's it. And here's why you would use it, like the objectives. Here's the description of what the metric is. Um, I still think visualizations are great because here, here's you know an example of how you could take a look at this metric, meaning the implementations too. Gary, you're scratching your chin. You have yeah, I'm going back and forth on whether someone who wants to understand a metric and comes to it, and I have no anecdotal evidence either way. Um, my, I might have an N of one. I, this might be a story that I'm replaying in my mind over and over yeah. again, just so you know. <laughs> I'm just, so the way that I, I think about filters is that they are helping me as someone who might want to use the metric to think about how I might use it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. Anyway, I think there's value to it, but maybe we are not there yet. Can I um? Okay. Uh, open source ecosystem. Can I um? I'll make a proposal. Just kind of listening to everybody here. It doesn't seem like anybody's like completely averse. Like, do not touch the structure. It doesn't seem like anybody has that concern. Not hearing that. No, but what the optimal structure might be is yet to be determined. That's kind of also what I'm hearing. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to make that campaign promise that they have the optimal structure. So why don't I propose this? <laughs> I'll put an action item to myself. Because as, I don't know, whoever, whoever says these things, right? If you give somebody something in front of them, then it at least serves as a starting point that we can all go off of. Right now, we're, um, we don't have something to take a look at. And so I'll propose a structure for, um, uh, the metric layout, the definition layout, based on what I'm hearing today, not just on what's in my mind, but what I'm hearing today. I'll also propose in that structure what are required headings, so basically some cardinality in this, and what are optional subheadings within each of those headings. Does that make sense? So like, for example, I am not saying this is the way it is, that a required heading would be description, a required heading would be objectives, and a required heading would be implementation. Those would be the three required headings as an example. And then underneath implementation, optional subheadings would be filters. Are you typing this somewhere? What's that? Are you typing this up? I'm just trying to. Yeah, it is. Okay. In our minutes. For some reason, I'm just more visual. So descriptions required, objectives required, implementation. This is an example. Implementation required. So maybe I don't have to do this. And then under implementation, <laughs> an optional head. Yeah, filters would be optional. You could include them if you'd like. Um, visualization. Yeah, references. Maybe that's required. I don't know. Optional required. Uh, yeah, definitely. We there was a lot of discussion about whether they call it references or resources. So I don't think we should change it. But known implementations, um, and I have a comment on known implementations too. And then maybe, uh, uh, yeah, references maybe as a highest level heading, but optional. Resources though. Because we had a long discussion with the evolution working group about whether it was references or resources, and we landed on resources. We landed on resources. So yes, something like that. So I don't know if you were all seeing this and what. Thank you for typing that up, Georg. You're welcome. And tell Jesus I stood by our resources decision. So something like this. What 
So if we have the the only thing I would say about creating subheadings for known and reference implementations is to then define. I guess. Yeah, I guess we know what I know what a reference implementation is. I don't know if everyone on the call knew it. We intended it to be prior to call. So sometimes, like what these headings are, are obvious, like description and objectives. Other times, I don't know that they are as obvious, particularly with, frankly, all the subheadings under implementation. So we might want to provide some guidance about what's intended under there. Visualization. Sure, and, and maybe they collapse. Maybe it becomes filters, visualizations, and known implementations, period. I mean, I'm okay with su separate subheadings. Um, I just think. No, I get, I get the point. Yeah. Okay. Georg, did you have a comment? I, I'm looking at the diversity and inclusion working group because they are the only working group that uses a different template. Yeah, common might too for some of the metrics that show up in common. So basically. Yeah. And so with this new proposed template, I see an opportunity to align all the templates. And what the diversity inclusion have is description objectives. Those are the same. And then yep. implementation, they also have, they just call it slightly different with sample strategies and for strategies and success metrics. Can you so yeah. add them as um, data collection strategies? Do they have the, is there a top level heading implementation? I'm sorry, I'm not looking at it right now. It's not. Okay. But it can easily be changed. Okay. I think Eric's right. It could be. And this might be a good way for us to unify some of those. I think this is a good idea. Okay. I post not the template, but um, yep. So they have strategies and success metrics. I see. Okay. So data collection strategy, and I'm going to call it data collection strategy because when we talk about strategies, that's really what we're talking about, how we collect the data. And then we have success metrics. And this is where it becomes a little challenging when diversity and inclusion talks about success metrics. Mm -hmm. um, that is what a metric is for everyone else. So you could you say that again? When diversity and inclusion talks about success metrics, yep. each item itself could be a metric I at see. the level of other working groups. I so see. I works at a higher level, but anyway, that, that's semantics that we don't have to tease out right now. I see what you're saying though. So then what you're taking a look at what you had proposed. So then we would have four required top level headings for every metric, which is description, objective, implementation, and resources, period. And I think objective, to your point, descriptions and objectives are the same. I think they're understood the same between the working groups. Agreed. Yes. And then implementation, we would have a kind of a variety of optional subheadings that could be pulled from kind of based on the nature of the working group. Yep. Okay. Mm, what do people think about this? Other thoughts on this? I like it. I think that makes the release considerably easier uh, from from my end, anyway. Okay, it's all about you. <laughs> yeah. yeah but I think it makes right. it more consistent for everybody else too. I think it'll make our metrics easier to easier to look at across working groups. Okay. okay cool. Yeah, I like I like um, I like this. 
John, okay. you're very difficult to hear. I'm difficult to hear? Yeah. Oh, have I been all day or just now? Just now. Oh, maybe I, was, I sort of leaned back and stepped away from my monitor. Am I clearer now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was saying that I, I, I kind of like where we landed here. So, um, I, yeah. I was going to say maybe taking a, oh, I'm sorry, Sean, go ahead and finish your. I'm time. done. No. Well, I, I cut you off then. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Sometimes I should be cut off, man. So maybe in this list, if you're looking in the Google Drive, should we make all of the things underneath implementation optional? Because like in the DNI sense, right, there may not be visualizations. Like we would just have one template. See what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. Okay. With the intention that if you're going to have an implementation heading, you will at least pick one of these <laughs> to, to kind of give a description of what that implementation is about. Okay. Okay. Um, well, should I? Okay. So then another. So then another comment on here is if we have these two known implementation and reference implementation, I think we have to be, particularly around known implementation, we have to be very diligent that this has actually been implemented in a tool. Not that it can be implemented in a tool, but that it has been implemented. And I was thinking about this. I think we got a little lax sometimes that yes, this is something that I could produce, but it actually hasn't been produced. Does that make sense? The difference between can produce it and currently producing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me make sure I understand that. So you're saying the known tool implementations would be it has been implemented in a tool Correct. and reference implementation would be could be implemented in a tool, but maybe hasn't been yet. Well, this is where I get confused no. with reference. No, no, you got the first part right. Okay. So the, if we're going to talk about an implementation, whether it's known or referenced, it has, like, it has to exist. We can't talk about the potential for it to exist. That's not what these implementations are about. Um, but I mean, is there a reason why we need to distinguish it? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure like people, I mean, this is just an example, right? I mean, whether it's really deployed in production or not, I'm not sure if that would make a huge difference to me as a consumer. Okay. Well, you're just talking I mean, about that, I mean, that's just my thought. Like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's great that like, you know, like somebody like uh, some communities actually deploy this, but I mean, it's good to know, but I'm not going to use, it's unlikely that I'm going to use the exact same implementation because my community is different or I'm using different data source or whatever the reason sure. is, right? I mean, I, I think the key value is that, hey, here is sort of an example of how you could like deploy this. I mean, th there might be some customization needed for your community, but uh -huh. I don't, I think like, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just a level of detail that I'm not sure if that's really needed, uh, but I'd, I'd like to hear other people's thoughts too. So my, my thought here was on visualizations, and I, I, hopefully I'm addressing your point here, that visualizations would give somebody who comes to the metric kind of like what you're talking about, just a way to kind of get their head around what it might look like, mm -hmm. you know? So just here's a visualization right. from Augur right. or here's a visualization from Grimoire Lab. Right. The, the known implementation <clears throat> is if you actually want to deploy this, kind of as is, Grimoire Lab does that for us. Hmm. So that's what the known implementation is to me. So the visualization is something that I could just look at quickly on the document to just kind of get my head around what this is all about. But then there might be something to be said for knowing that this metric is actually deployed in Augur, Kibble, or more lab, whatever it might be. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's more clear. Ray, I don't know if that made yeah, sense. Yeah, or, or the other way we can do, I mean, 
I mean, I'm, we can do like, we can just call it implementation, use a generic term. And then, mm -hmm. and then if it's, if it's, uh, if it's known, then we can note that, right? Like here is, here's how it's actually implemented in Grimoire Lab. And I mean, otherwise you don't, you don't mention it, but I mean, I'm okay either way, but I, okay. I don't want to have like a too many categories under implementation, I guess. That's the only thing I was concerned about. I no, mean, I it's not a, not a huge concern, but. And I do have a hard time myself. I know you yeah. explained it, Sean, but kind of teasing out the difference between reference implementation and known implementation. I mean, I know what was intended originally and a definition, like I could write up that, def I, could, I could write up the intended definition and it could be included as an example uh, with the template, right? Like, you know, delete this, but here's what's meant. Um, apparently I talk like a youper. Okay. So I, personally, I think the level of detail that we need is a sample visualization that if somebody is coming to the page and just wants to get their head around what this could look like, the potential for it, um, and then just links to the tools that have actually deployed this thing, this thing being the metric. like and full stop that's that's where i think we need to stop and i think that kind of addresses your point ray which is keeping it simple yep. here's what it could look like here's the tools that do it what are some other thoughts on this here you're typing what do you think I'm filling in descriptions for each section for the template. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I'll um, I'll at least put together a. I'll still put something together based. On, basically, it looks like I'm just going to copy and paste what Garrick has typed. <laughs> put it into a markdown, um, something that we can talk about next week. Maybe on the next week is actually the, the entire monthly call. So thanks everybody for the feedback on that. Um, I did have one other thing. So I had reached out, if you recall, we had talked about working with an open source community to do metrics deployment. Do you remember this? So actually trying to deploy the chaos metrics as published. Um, and I'd reached out to Kate and she was happy to have Zephyr be part of that. And so she's connected me with folks at the Zen project as well, but I'll have to reping them. So, so the premise for those of you that don't know is we're really trying to take a look at how the metrics that we have released in version one uh, can actually be used to generate really just even small one page reports for a community. Um, highlighting the insights that come from the metrics. So, good. Oh, I had one other question too on the metrics thing. Um, Mm. So just to confirm, right? So if we make a change to the template, it's just for the template going forward, right? Version one stays as is. Correct. I'm just confirming that, that we don't do anything retrospectively. I suppose that would be weird for a <laughs> version release. <laughs> Am I? Okay, that's fine. Kevin's yeah, got nothing think... going on, right? But <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I think I though for, for version two, maybe we should revamp the metrics that were released in uh, version one into the new template. Say that again? As, as part of version two, maybe we should revamp the metrics in version one into new, into the new template and call them version two of that metric oh, oh, or whatever yeah. it is you called it. 
I get what you're saying. And actually, I, that would hopefully be a fairly straightforward exercise, but yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Cool. Gotcha. Yeah, because if we actually, if we didn't do that, then we would have a lot of, we would actually have like four templates in version two. Mm -hmm. Or three templates. Okay. Um, why that took a lot of time. Thank you everybody for your feedback on that. Um, I saw somebody put chaos count on here. Oh yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to like, I just want, that was just a reminder for myself. I didn't, I mean, Matt, if you have anything else, I mean, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm, that's, that's good. Everybody, that was yeah. super helpful. Thank you everybody. Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. I missed like a call for the past few weeks. I had like a crazy, uh, um, period of travels, but yeah, I just wanted to offer my volunteer my services for ChaosCon. Uh, look like people offer like general help, but happy to be on the programming committee or anything else that you guys need. Uh, Want to raise my hand? Thanks. And uh, yeah. somewhat related to ChaosCon, like, did was the table request actually submitted for FOSAM or like? Yep. Oh. oh wow i thought i was gonna i was supposed to do that but thanks thanks for taking care of that but oh cool well, yeah no you. worries like great i was like i mean i had like a lot of FOSM related stuff that i had to do like including for GitLab and like one last thing for me thank you yeah thanks for remembering I'll get, yeah i'll get you a belgian beer at, at, at in brussels i look forward to yeah yep and I can tell you, um, Georg is working to, you're working to get the payments scheduled? For the car venue, yeah. I'm not having any luck right now with getting a response. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. Okay. So that you can get book the venue and pay it through community bridge. Oh, is this the community bridge issue or like? Yeah, we just need to get the funds out of there ah. to pay for the hotel. You know what I mean? So we just yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I mean, Matt and Georg, I was going to send you a separate email about that, but uh, we can take that offline. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that was just a quick. Kevin, is there a is the page up for ChaosCon Europe? We have a page. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. And the next thing would be to put the CFP on there. Sorry, that's my fault. I'll work on that. It's on oh, my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fess up anyways. Yeah, it's on my to-do list. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. It, I, I think we still have a little bit of time. It would be great to be doing this around the same timeline that the dev rooms are calling for papers. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking. So I wasn't, uh, I didn't bump it up above the other urgent things on my to-do list, but I will, I will try to get to it this week. Okay. And I'll start sending out the sponsorship requests this week too. I haven't done that. I haven't really started that. So I'll get rolling on that. Um, okay, great. Anything else on ChaosCon? Um, I did wanna, Kevin, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. You had put together a calendar, a chaos calendar. Yes. Is it up online? Yeah, it's a, it's a pop calendar. I can share the link. Uh, I haven't shared it yet because I wanted to make sure that all of the uh, the times were right, and then I was going to. Uh, this, so basically, Kevin has put together. Um, I don't know what you call it—a calendar that you can. It's put in your calendar <laughs> that is, that is chaos calendar. specific. It has the that has every event on it. Did you share it? No. 
No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I generally get my email through my uh, the Mac client, so I'm having to okay. log in to the browser to, to get the, the shareable link. I'll continue talking. I'll share it in a moment. No, we're just waiting very patiently for this link. <laughs> Yeah, no heat, Kevin. Well, I did share the link with you, so technically you could share it as well. I, I deleted it. Oh, so <laughs> we want to have a race now. I see. <laughs> I see. While I'm going through this, Sean, you need okay, to. Okay, here it is. Okay, uh, it's in the chat, so I'm going to copy it over to the minutes. Sean, I also put something in the chat for you while people are looking at that. You might want to send a pull request to update your logo. Oh my goodness. It's quite outdated, isn't it? We've just... Sean, I cannot hear you again. Um, I was mumbling, that's why. Um, yes, that's quite outdated. I should create a pull request to fix that logo. There actually, there is an issue created for that currently. Wow. You guys are good. <laughs> yeah. So what do people think of the calendar that Kevin said? I think it's all up to date. I think it's good. Yeah, it's actually helpful to... if I can add it. Is it a published calendar that I can add to the list of Google calendars? I, which usually they are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, it's a that's super public helpful. published calendar. So yeah, you can grab it now if you want. Yeah. Cause I basically keep, so if I go. What do people think about this? Cause I know like Don for common, you had sent out, you know what I mean? You had sent out your calendar invite to specific people. Yep. Well, you still need to do that to get it on people's calendars so that people don't book over it. Adding uh, an additional calendar to your view doesn't actually change that. So, I Could mean, you, I... It depends how many calendars you're going to view at once. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I still like to invite the people who I think are going to attend on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think it's a good practice. Yes, I agree. It's been helpful for regular attendees of the working groups that I'm in. And um, so that it that actually is still possible with this public calendar. Uh, if I were to give you edit rights, for example, you could go in for the common uh, the common metrics group meeting and add an, a list of invitees to it. Uh, however, the the calendar itself is still public and can be grabbed by by everyone. I'll um. I'm just going to share my screen here really briefly because. So while you're doing that, so Don, we're trying to find this like balance between being able to get these meetings on people's calendars, just kind of generally mm -hmm. it's if they want to, but then also kind of to your point it's, of inviting people specifically. So I think, I think if, it's both. I mean, I think, I think that what Kevin has is fantastic and this is a really great way for me to like see what all the meetings are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in the but lower, if, sorry, go ahead. Finish. Go ahead. I just wanted to shit in the lower right where it says Google Calendar. If you click that, it gives you the option, and it, yeah, I've already done it, but it gives you the option of adding it to your calendar as one of the calendars that you monitor, which mm -hmm. personally I find really helpful because, like, I have calendars for my research group and my kids and my wife, and like, and like 10 calendars, so I kind of know what everyone's doing and having this. Is clicking here and just having it as being one of your Google calendars you can turn on, I find very helpful. Yeah, well, it is. It's well. super, it's super helpful. And I do that with loads of calendars. I have like the Kubernetes yeah. calendars and some other things like that. What mm -hmm. what it doesn't do um, is when uh, well, it doesn't block your calendar off. So me as right. an employee of a company, if I just use this calendar, people are gonna right. book me in meetings right over top of these. And so I have to have it separately on my calendar as an actual calendar item on whatever calendar people try to schedule me on, on. And that's what I try to do for other people. And that's why I invite people to the, to the calendar, partly so that they always remember it, but also because if 
if they're invited and that's the calendar that they use for work, then people won't book meetings over top of the. I see. The yeah. So like Kevin, I think it would be helpful to give like basically everyone on this call or at least all of the working group chairs <coughs> access to invite people from this calendar because that would solve Don's problem and take it off of your uh, list of responsibilities. Would that solve your problem, Don? I don't think so. Well, if, if so if Don could Can open your screen like, again. So yeah, hang on. So maybe I'll just... can show us what you mean because I think you're onto something. Yeah. I agree. Um, okay. I'm sharing my screen again. It's only the cast calendar. Um, but if I had edit rights on this meeting, I could then edit the list of invitees and I could invite all the people that I normally expect that normally want to be at these working group meetings, the ones in my case are evolution and risk that, that I have a set of people that I have invited to a meeting on my calendar. And uh, so giving a certain number of people the rights to edit this lets us have the rights to invite people or invite ourselves. And then that becomes an invitation on my own calendar as well. You know, the way that you could do it also do it to get around the issue of it being on your own calendar is at least on Google Calendar, you can like right click and do the copy to your calendar. You're right. Um, function, um, which I do copy that. To Sean Goggins right here. Yeah. Just like so that. I, so I do a ton of that just to kind of solve where you're after, Dawn, of just like, I may not care about all of the meetings, but there are certain ones I know I want to be on and I can force those to be on my calendar. Yeah. But what that does not do um, is it does when that meeting time changes or yeah. when some detail changes, it does not change on your calendar. So That's if true. that meeting gets canceled or moved, um, it's not in the right place on your calendar. That is true. Uh, if only there was an iCal standard for things like this, right? I know. And, <laughs> and so, so I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I am in a whole bunch of open source projects with all kinds yeah. of calendar issues. So I've just seen all of this recently. The to-do yeah. group has had the problem of we did give everyone right access to it. And people keep accidentally deleting it off of the wrong calendar. So they go yeah. on holiday, they delete it off their calendar, and it deletes it for everybody because they didn't realize that they were editing the project's calendar instead of their own personal calendar. I have done um, that. I've done that to meeting invites where yeah. I thought I was deleting one meeting and I deleted everybody's. Yeah. Yeah. So the way the I, can, I can tell you the way, the way Kubernetes manages this, and it's yeah. probably, um, probably overkill for, for this one, um, but because, because all of the meetings for Kubernetes are tied to specific special interest groups, and each special interest group has its own mailing list, when you join a mailing list, you get invites to all of the meetings for that special interest group. I recently joined the cluster lifecycle special interest group and got like a bajillion meetings because they have a whole bunch of sub projects and many, many meetings. And those, and you get that as an invite from, um, from some calendar and it goes on your own personal calendar at the email address that you subscribed to the mailing list with. Um, and when the SIG leader cancels the meeting, it's canceled off my calendar. Um, and so that works quite well, but they also use Google Groups for their... Uh, Kubernetes manage it. What's that, Go ahead, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin you... I'm sorry, I was, I was just going to ask you that, if they use Google Groups for their email list. They do, so. which is probably how that works. Um, but it's also kind of overkill for a project this size because we don't have a million special interest groups. And, and there's a specific URL that people are supposed to invite to the calendar invite that puts it on the main calendar. And sometimes people forget to do that. We're actually, I, yeah, I just wrote some Python to like pull things out and do like a comparison of which ones are, are where, and we've got, we've got a bit of a mess. So it's not, it's not perfect for sure. We, we have a bunch of meetings that are in, um, that are in uh, the SIG, SIGs.yaml is what we call it, the, that are in like the main main thing, but aren't on the regular calendar that they're supposed to be on. So, so calendars no, are hard is the TLDR no, here. So tell me the three things to do to solve this problem, right? <laughs> Not that so I love, I love Kevin's idea of having a calendar that you can put on your calendar because it's nice that I can see all of the other meetings. If there's one that I occasionally want to drop in and out of, I still think that kind of the people leading the working groups, if you have some regular attendees, um, having it on your calendar, I think 
I think helps and you can invite those people or as a working group, you can decide not to do that. Um, but then it's up to each individual person to put it on their calendar and they may or may not have it and they may or may not get scheduled over. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I like to manage it. And I, I don't know of a, I don't know okay. of a better way. So one of the issues I can see with that is updating your calendar and the chaos calendar. If something changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, already we have to update our calendar and the website if something changes. So you'd also need to update a second calendar. So that'd be three places you need to update it. Although you I don't, I don't like any of these out. solutions, to be fair. You probably have I mean, to out the Google calendar somehow and just pull from that data too on the website just to maybe cut down one. But yeah, you're still, you're still down to two. We could just embed the calendar on the website. Yeah, and use that as the uh, the primary uh, uh, on the participation page. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Don. This is not worth racking our heads to automate. <laughs> it, it, it just. How about this? We we just embed it on the participate page. Tell people right. it's available if they'd like yep. it, but it's subject yep. to change. Manage your own calendar. That's yeah. the best way. Good luck. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. That seems fair. Uh, I will say the only thing that groups.io does slightly nice in this is that if there are changes that are made on the main calendar, because they basically you're basically doing the same thing here, but they do do notifications if meeting invites have changed, but it's not everybody's clients a little bit wonky of how it sucks that in. So just just to not to throw out more tooling ideas, but just throwing that out there. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. So I did add uh, I did add Sean and Don as admins on the that calendar. Uh, do you want me to remove you? Are you planning on using it or? Um. I would say remove me because the chances of me needing to update something um, yeah. are not outweighed by the chances of me accidentally deleting something. And I would say the same thing that your Dawn's story <laughs> reminded me of things I've done wrong in the past, and you don't want to trust me with something like this. To be fair, someone else should have admin access um, because we don't want it to be just one person. Because of... right. Yeah, I think right now it's Kevin, Matt, and I. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I think Kevin, I think it's making this available for sure. And if people want to use it, that's great and possibly embedding it on the participate page. While we are talking about the participate page, I noticed that we don't have the software calls there yet. Oh, okay. Um, so we do not. I don't know if we want to, now that we have a calendar, remove all of our different working groups and software calls and everything, just have the calendar as the source of information on where to find the meeting minutes, how to join, or if we still want to maintain it, and then we should add the software. I'm more so excited for the latter. Because I know Grimoire Lab has its own mailing list that is currently not on the participate page, and I believe Augur has a Slack channel that is currently not on anywhere on our website. I would, I would uh, probably Augur should create a mailing list. Um, personally, I like the look of this page. I think mm -hmm. it gives a nice description of each one of the working groups. Yeah, I don't want to miss the description because this is, this is a more accessible way for people outside of the project to figure out which working groups they want to participate in than a calendar would. A calendar is just, calendar. I think, less accessible. So yeah. then add the Grimoire Lab and the Augur meetings to this? Yeah. OK. Sean, if you see a need for a mailing list, for an Augur separate mailing list, um, then we can create one through the Linux Foundation. But just saying, the Grimoire Lab mailing list is not being used. So I don't know if there really is a need. It's a it's a Linux Foundation mailing list, and it's not being used. Is is your Slack channel open, Sean? 
Is it public? Um, I, I have to even remember what it is. Okay. Um, it is, I believe it is open to the public. And um, right now I have to, I believe it's my- It's just business. information to make available in an auger box. That's all. Yeah. But if, if that's your main, I think that's the main way that auger communicates is via Slack. Yeah. Well, there's no reason to change that. Yeah. And um, I mean, somewhere I have a, I'll find that. And okay. Add it to the pull request associated with the auger. We are no change. We are at the top of the hour. Party lunch for me. It's lunch. lunch time. So next <laughs> next week is the the monthly call. Just FYI. So if you have agenda items that you want to bring up in particular, just send them my way. Okay. And then I'd also just like to say that just one last thing. Georg has been elected as co-chair. Congratulations, co-director. And uh, the two new board members are Daniel and Nicole. Congratulations. Yes. So, All super exciting news. That's really, that's really, really great news. So, all right. Well, that's a nice one, Okay. Let's see you. See you later. All right.